The single biggest misconception about leadership is that leadership is primarily what we do outwardly with and to other people. And really it's... There's these different um, stages of leadership. Leading other people starts with being able to lead yourself. The best and worst parts about being a CEO. When groups of people are in that process of unlocking their best, special things just happen. I kind of won everything I wanted to win. I didn't realize there's whatever I'm looking for, it isn't here. What is the most important thing about leadership? Oh man, that's a great question. Hey everyone, I am Ryan Hawk, host of The Learning Leader Show and owner of this YouTube channel. I just learned a fascinating stat, and that is 95% of people who view our videos are not yet subscribed. And so, if you'd like to ensure you're seeing all of the amazing interviews we're going to do, and we have some good ones coming up, then smash that subscribe button. I know everyone says that, but it's critical to ensure you're seeing what we have coming up. So I thank you for viewing, and I look forward to you being a part of this learning leader journey moving forward. Thank you so much. Mike, it's great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be with you. All right, so I want to go back years ago. You're a college student. There was a class that you really wanted to take called Freedom in Greece. Now, it was wow. the most popular class uh, at, the, at where you went to school. And you decided to show up on the first day of class, even though you weren't able to get enrolled in it. And if you could convince the professor to give you a special exception, which they called a pink slip, then you could take the course. So you show up at the classroom. It's packed with students. Every seat is full, and hundreds of people stood around the edge of the room. The professor, a legend apparently named Rufus Fears, started the lecture. And the first thing out of his mouth was, if you are here trying to get a pink slip, I can tell you that the class is full and there will be no pink slips. What happened next? So what happened next was I sat in the class and was really captivated by the lecture and I quickly understood why this person had the most popular class at OU, even though, uh, you know, I don't know that Greek culture uh, and in the time of uh, the Athenians, you know, was was something that a lot of college students uh, were thinking about. And at the end of the class, I just kind of sat in my seat and absorbed uh, what I had listened to as everybody filed out. And it just so happened that as I was kind of sitting there with my thoughts, I realized I was one of the last people left in the classroom and the teacher was still at the front of the, the room. And I thought, well, you know, what the heck, I'll, I'll just go say hi to him and say, that was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I did. And surprisingly, as we talked, he said, you know, seems like you're really interested. You should come by my office and talk more about this. And so the next day I showed up to his office hours and his door was closed. He had a, a notice on his door and the notice said the same thing that he'd said at the beginning of the class, that there will be absolutely no pink slips given for freedom in Greece. I knocked on the door. He opened the door. He was sitting at a, a round table in the middle of his office. And I looked and on that table, there was a stack of pink slips. And he said, come on in. We had a conversation and he gave me a pink slip to be a part of the class. I went on to take, he had another Kind of complimentary class called freedom in rome and even though i was a business major i ended up taking a letters capstone that he taught so i ended up taking three courses over the course of my, my college career with him but it was a, a seminal moment for me because i think it taught me a principle about life there's a lot of people that say they want something but at the very first sign of difficulty they abandon and this was the first time that i saw that little bit of extra persistence of showing that you really do want something, that you really are willing to fight for it a little bit. It's amazing how often that's all it takes to get to the next level, whether that's in our character or as a leader or in entrepreneurship. And so I learned a lot of things to that class uh, about, you know, Greek and Roman civilization and, and the way that people thought. But the most important lesson I learned before I was even in the class, which was about the the importance of persistence and how just sheer want to will take you a long way in life. Why do you think this isn't normal? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I mean, I think some of it is our own insecurity that 
when we aspire to do something significant, I think there's a, a voice in the back of most of our heads that tells us you're not going to be able to do this or this is silly or you're going to fail. And immediately, whenever we get any piece of feedback that that we kind of look stupid or that we don't know what we're doing, it's just easy to be like, oh, yeah, you know, the voice in my head was right. And so we have to develop, I think, the kind of internal fortitude and self-confidence to say, I'm going to power past that voice and I'm going to keep going. One example of this, in Oklahoma, which is where we're based, I've become a little bit of an avatar for entrepreneurship. That when people think of entrepreneurship in this state, I think, especially when they think about younger entrepreneurs, I'm, I'm probably one of the first faces that they think of. But interestingly, I didn't think of myself as an entrepreneur until I was about 35. And and I really I didn't have the self confidence to think about myself that way. I mean, I, I I thought entrepreneurship was cool. I thought creating things was very cool, but I didn't have the self belief that I could actually do that. And interestingly, my younger brother, who um, got into entrepreneurship before I did, I think watching him and then him inviting me into it with him, doing it together with him, is how I developed the self-belief and the, the confidence that I could do this and I could go for it. So today I, I do a lot of teaching and as you mentioned, writing online. And part of the reason why I do it is that I would love it if I was one of those voices that people hears that says, you can do this. Like, not that it's going to be easy, you know, not that it you, you won't face challenges because those things are definitely going to happen, but that you can actually do this uh, because I needed that um, to develop the self-belief to take on some of the challenges I have. What about for that person right now who is questioning themselves or another uh, element of that is I think we think it's too common that people think too small. They don't think big enough. And I'm curious if you could take us back to the beginning of Simple Modern. Like how big did you think? Because you probably had imposter syndrome. You, you, you just admitted, right? Your brother needed to push you. But I love, man, Mike, I, and I feel like you're probably – you're probably uh, you're a great representation of this from going from a place that where you question yourselves to to now I'm guessing you think really big, and I want to help people just go big, man. Like think really mm -hmm. big from the beginning that it is possible. What advice would you give to those who are currently thinking too small on how to think bigger? So I would start here. I would say there's a lot of different ways that you can be ambitious. Mm -hmm. And some of them are much better than others. Some of them are much more meaningful than others. Some of them have much more of a ramification for the lives of other people and ripple outward for a lot longer than others. And so choosing what you're going to be ambitious about is actually, I think, as a leader, one of the primary things you have to get right. One of the things that happened to me, just to share a little bit of my story, when I was graduating from college, I was a finance major. And through a series of events, some of it was getting married right out of college, I actually accepted a nonprofit ministry job right out of college, which if you were thinking, hey, I want to be in business, I want to be an entrepreneur, it is not at all what you would think is the ideal first job out of college. And Yet, it was tremendous for me. I, I, I attribute so much of my success in the business world, ironically, to being in a nonprofit job where I had to raise my salary. And the reason is this. In my early 20s, along with my wife, I think I really established the dream for my life and what I thought had meaning and purpose in life. And as a derivative of that, I had an idea of the things that I wanted to be ambitious about with my life. And once I had clarity on those things, it became a lot easier to start to think about how I was going to lead people and how I was going to lead myself towards being the type of person that, that could actually lead people towards those things. And so with our company today, uh, a lot of people, the Simple Modern Story is very interesting from a number of different angles. Uh, we, we bootstrapped the company and in eight years, we've basically grown it to about a quarter of a billion dollars in annual revenue. And that is, that is a really remarkable story. And yet, I don't think it's the most remarkable thing about the company because the company doesn't exist primarily to make money. I think about the company as it primarily exists to impact the lives of people 
So that's the team that I lead. That's the customers we serve. That's the partners we work with. That's the community that we're a part of. Um, it's why we have a really atypical mission statement. We exist to give generously because the entire purpose for the organization is actually how can we impact the lives of people through sharing, more or less. And it just so happens that we sell water bottles and tumblers to fund that vision. And so interestingly, we aimed at impacting the lives of people. And as a derivative of that, as a nice side benefit of that, we've been able to grow a thriving business. I don't think it's a coincidence that when you have a mission that gets people excited and gets people out of bed, then the ability to attract and recruit and retain unbelievable people, it gets a lot easier. And when you have unbelievable people, no matter what you're trying to do, it ends up happening with a lot higher level of excellence. So for me, where it started was, I am an ambitious person, but having the discipline to focus that ambition on things that really matter was the start of, I think, really unlocking my effectiveness. There's a, a principle, I've heard other people like Bezos mention this, but which I think is a great principle, the, the kind of 75-year-old self principle of, how will I look back on these things when I'm 75 or 80 post-career and what will be meaningful to me then? And using that as a frame of reference today really helps me to keep the first thing and the most important thing, the, the first thing. And then as a result, there's been success across a number of different areas. But it started with my conviction that actually making an impact in the lives of people is the most significant thing you can do. And we're talking about leadership. I mean, fundamentally, that's what leadership is. Leadership isn't just, I have tactical and strategic abilities to organize and get people to do what I want them to do. It's really more about, I have the ability Did you have this ambition and belief and clarity in 2015? I mean, or does it take time to get it? Because at some point you just need to make money, right? You, you're trying to mm -hmm. sell something. You're trying to create something that people want to buy. Was, was this ambition and this mission happening from the very beginning? Or did you grow to be able to document this and co codify it for your company? Yeah, so... Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, okay. For sure, when we started the company, we knew we want to make a different type of company. When we founded the company, I was actually kind of at a crossroads where I felt like uh, I had I'd been in the nonprofit world for 10 years. My, I'd helped my brother start a business that got very big, very quick. And after a few years running that with him, I knew I either wanted to go back in the nonprofit world or I wanted to build a very different type of business. So when we started the company, we knew we wanted to build something pretty different. And we knew that we wanted generosity and relationships to be a really central piece of that. We knew we wanted to use e-commerce because we had some real skills in e-commerce and that was about it. So I can talk about it probably with a lot of eloquence today, but I want everybody listening to hear me really clearly. It is an iterative process of getting to the point of having the level of, of clarity and focus. I mean, I think a good analogy here would be if you imagine a camera that's not on autofocus, but it's on manual focus. We had the lens pointed in a very particular direction from day one. But over the weeks and months and years that have happened since, I think we've turned the dial and it's come more and more into sharp focus, exactly what it is that we're aiming at and the ability to articulate it. So we started with wanting to build something different for sure. But you mentioned it. In the early days of a business, you have to be opportunistic. It has to be like whatever it takes, you yep. know, like where is the opportunity? Where can we generate revenue? Where can we find the gross profit to, to fund our salaries? And so there was a lot of, even though I'm able to talk now about like the high ideals and all this stuff, like, man, I was grinding. I mean, there were some weeks where I was putting in 80, 90, 100 hours and I had to be excellent individually at things in order to help get the company off the ground. And in some ways, I think that process was really helpful for me. And it's one of the things I like about entrepreneurship is 
you're, you're hi- when you're hiring people, you're hiring people that are culture fits and mission fits, but you're also trying to hire people that will be exceptional team members and that can do the job. And one of the things that I help, I think helped enable me to be able to identify the type of people that could excel and do the job really well and with excellence is doing the job myself. So we definitely went through that whole phase where, you know, uh, they, I use an analogy sometimes that I think there's these different um, stages of leadership. So the first stage, we'll call it a player stage where it's like, if you're not throwing touchdown passes, then you're not scoring. And, and then if you, if you're successful enough, you start to hire people and you go into this player coach phase where it's kind of like, okay, now I have some teammates, but they still don't really know what they're doing. I'm having to coach them on the fly as I'm also trying to throw touchdown passes. And then hopefully you get to this point where you're able to go to the sideline and you're able to just coach. And, and at this point, I'm, I'm probably a coach or maybe even a, a step beyond that with Simple Modern. But going through that progression, I think, has been uh, really helpful. I, I, I love the title of the podcast because one of the experiences I've had going through nine years with Simple Modern is that I've, I've led the same company, but I've really basically had like five or six different jobs. Because at different levels of revenue and different numbers of employees, what's actually needed of me to be an effective leader has been, you know, dramatically different. And so just when it's like raising kids, it's like just when you feel like you know how to raise a three-year-old, they're four. And then you've got to you've got to learn a whole new skill set and you've got to kind of adjust to the way that they've grown and their needs. And leading a growing company, a growing team is the same way that even once you feel like you kind of have it figured out then you realize, oh man, the roles changed, the team's changed. And I have to continue to learn and grow in order to be the kind of leader I want to be. And I do really strongly believe in the idea that at some point, the ability for your team to grow is capped by the leader's ability to grow and learn themselves. So anyway, that's a a long answer for a short question. Thank you. Uh, it's so good already, man. This is good stuff. I can see you. Sh- you if you should be a college professor, I'd take the class, write books for sure. Um, you mentioned uh, how your role as a CEO has changed. And I love the the process player, player, coach, coach, and now kind of like probably more general manager and coach because mm-hmm. you have to mm-hmm. select players, um, select team members. What are what are the best and worst parts about being a CEO? So I can tell you for many people, the answer about the worst part of being a CEO is the stress and the isolation. Now, for me, that hasn't been the case. And there's a number of things that I have done um, to to help, uh, I think, protect myself from that. The, The stress piece, there have definitely been stressful times. And uh, I, I wouldn't downplay those, but I would not describe the last eight years as being primarily defined by stress. I, I would say stress has been more the, uh, much more the exception than the rule. And the reason why I haven't experienced the level of isolation that many leaders feel, I think, is a combination of trying to build a team culture where relationships were highly valued um, and also being deliberate and intentional with the way that we've built the team uh, where – uh, the, the initial way I built the team is I, I actually went and recruited people that I had known for at least a decade or more. Um, but then as we've hired and expanded the team, personal referrals have been a big part of that. And as a result, we really, ha- when we bring new team members in, it's amazing how quickly they integrate into the relational fabric of the company. We we invest money in things like we bring in lunch every single day Everybody takes lunch at the same time and we go out and we don't talk about work. We talk about life. We talk about what we did with our kids over the weekend, things like that. So the fact that I'm a part of a community, that I'm not just in a role, but I'm in a community has really protected me from that. Most CEOs, many CEOs do not experience that. And um, I think it's really easy to feel isolated and and to feel discouraged or depressed. Um, Another big part of this is an identity thing that I think I had to learn in my 20s. And and to some extent, I'm still learning. But that where you look to find identity really defines what goes on in your mind and your heart. 
And I'm a CEO, but that's not who I am. That's not my identity. It's a role that I have and it's a hat that I wear, but it's not the th the thing I look to to define my identity. But for many leaders, that's where they find the central sense of identity. That like mm -hmm. when, okay, what is the thing that makes me worth loving, that makes me matter? Okay, it's my role. And if that's the case, then what happens when the performance isn't there? What happens when you're not CEO anymore? And we actually know the answer to this, that many people, when they step out of a CEO role, they they go into a depression. They really struggle. They, they have to wander kind of in the wilderness for a few years to work through the, the emotional baggage that comes from that. I'm convinced a lot of that is a result of looking for identity in our roles instead of finding our identity in healthy places. And so, so that's another thing that's been helpful for me. And it's tempting. I see why it's tempting, especially when you're winning, especially when things are going well. It, it is very tempting to say, yeah, I, I want to find my identity and the success of the company or the way the company is viewed. But I have, I've had to develop, I think, the internal self-discipline to not find it there. And this is another place where I think community and relationships really matter is that I'm surrounded by people that they like me, they respect my abilities, they are not in awe all of me. And they're, they're willing to say the hard thing to me. They're willing to tell me when I have something in my teeth. And that kind of um, relational connectedness can helps prevent me from trying to find identity in, in places that, that I shouldn't. So those are some of the, I mean, obviously it is hard that the buck stops with you. Um, and th there's a lot of challenges and, and going through COVID, some of the uncertainty there, like it, that's challenging when you're CEO. Often your people are looking to you to have the answers and you just don't have the answers. On the positive side, I just think the amount of leverage that you have to make an impact in the lives of other people is just so profound. You know, like the, the amount of resources and people that you get to direct and lead in the potential that exists there is just unbelievable. And to me, it's what makes the job. So, it, you know, for all the things that make it challenging, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want any other job because I really do feel like my time counts every day that I'm using it towards something meaningful. You mentioned, uh, you need to find your identity in healthy places. Well, how do you do that? So, um, I think every single person has to, at some point, have a real conversation with themselves about this subject. Um, for me personally, I'll start here. For me personally, one of the biggest life changes was that um, a, a relationship with God became important to me in college and was a real turning point for me. And I know that there's going to be people listening to this where spirituality is part of their life, it's not part of their life. This is not necessarily me saying like, that's the answer. It's more saying for me, it was a big turning point because up until that point, I had found my identity in the unhealthy places of accomplishment that my, my GPA, my resume, the awards that I won, these were the things that I kind of clung to in my heart as this is why people should love me or I should have value or my life has meaning. And ironically, the way that I was broken of that is that I, I kind of won everything I wanted to win and I had all the success that I wanted to have. And I got to kind of the end of that road and realized there's whatever I'm looking for, it isn't here. I mean, some other pitfalls that we can fall into, uh, I think possessions, you know, obviously defining ourselves to the things that we own, whether that's the money that we have or the, the car that we drive, um, de defining ourselves by our reputation, uh, defining ourselves by our roles, defining ourselves, um, I think, char even even characteristics, this can be really, you know, like uh, off, I'll see people that find their identity in their politics or people that find their identity in being the smartest person in the room, you know, and, and it's easy once you see it to really deconstruct the way that that can be destructive in people's lives. So in general, what I have found is that finding your identity in something that's bigger than self is the start of health. And, and there's a lot of research out there that says this. Um, and there's a lot, and, and finding identity in being a part of how you impact the lives of other people is another, there's some fingerprints out there that uh, across, um, you know, 
a bunch of different trains of thought. Research has borne this out, that this is kind of how we're hardwired as people. So that's what I would encourage everybody to, if you if you don't feel like you have clarity on this, that you're willing to look inward and have the hard conversation of yourself of what are the places where I'm looking for identity that are really like, uh, that, that are unhealthy. And another thing, well, I'll add one more idea. Here's another thing that can make something an unhealthy place to find identity. If, if it is something that is performance-based or something that is finite, then you're eventually going to come to some kind of a internal crisis because that thing's going to go away, right? So if, if your identity is in your beauty, then you're going to die a thousand deaths as you age, <laughs> you know? If your identity is in being the best, you know, basketball player in the world, then retirement is going to hit you like a ton of bricks, you know? And so what, what I think the healthier places that we find identity, they're outside of ourselves, they're others focused, and they're infinite instead of finite. And once we find those, but it's just amazing to me how much leading other people starts with being able to lead yourself. Mm. So true, man. Do you have a personal purpose? I know there's the, the company has all of the mission, purpose, values, all that stuff. What about for you? Like, do you have an individual purpose in life? Yeah. So the way that I think about my purpose is I want to use my effort and time to make the largest redemptive impact on the world that I can. And I think there's a ton of different facets to how that shows up. You, you've mentioned some of them already. It It is teaching. It is giving financially. It is leading and creating uh, value so that, you know, the, the pie is enlarged for everyone. It is parenting and pouring my life into my two children. It is being a good spouse. It is being a part of the community that, you know, like it, it is a part of improving and helping the lives of other people. There's there's all the, you know, I'm, like, I'm an elder in my church. There's, there's a ton of different dimensions to it. And, but I think the larger idea is I would love it if my life positively alter the trajectory of as many people's lives as possible. And I'm, I'm aware that I've been gifted with, uh, I have a lot of giftings and I'm very privileged in to, to be able to, to lead the company that I lead and to, to have the giftings that I have. So I get excited about the idea of sharing that with other people, hopefully to make a positive impact in their life. I, I think some of this, uh, I'll give a couple of pieces of context. I grew up in a family with two parents that were in mental health. So my dad was a psychologist. My mom was a social worker. And watching them, you know, when you're growing up, your parents, there's a couple of things that stand out to you that you remember about your parents and what they've said. And one of mine was that they told me several times, we did not pick these professions because they make good money. They don't. We picked these professions because we wanted to help people. And we think that that's the most important way that we could invest our lives. And I think as a child, hearing that from your parents made a pretty big impact on my worldview. And it's carried through all the way into my adulthood where, okay, part of the dream for how my life would be well used is positively impacting the lives of other people. The, the other piece I'll say here, in, inside of our company, we in our core values, one of our core values is generosity. But the way that we define generosity, I think, is, is really helpful. That generosity is not just writing checks and giving away money. That's what people usually think of. And for sure, that is a part of generosity. Like, if, if you're not being generous with your money, then, you know, what, what's going on? But generosity is so much more than that. It's really kind of a stance of saying, hey, all the gifts, all the abilities, all the things that I have, I'm going to be open-handed with them. I'm going to share them with others for the benefit of other people. And when you take that perspective, I think a couple of things happen. For somebody like me, one of the things that that protects you against is it protects you against the idea that just because I wrote, you know, a big check to so-and-so charity, that I've done my part and I don't have to be generous. It's like, no, you know, like it, no matter how much money I have, no matter how successful the company is, I think generosity is in all these different facets of my life. I mean, for example, it's why, why am I doing this podcast? Well, ultimately it's because hopefully by giving away these thoughts, I'm making an impact. And you know, like what you're doing, you said you're 500 something episodes into this. Hopefully the reason that you're doing that is because you're positively impacting people by giving away that information, by sharing that, that those thoughts. 
And when you start to take this kind of capital G vision of generosity, the other really cool thing that happens is that it makes it possible for everyone to be a leader in generosity. So think about my company context, for example. Great leaders, you know what they do more than anything else? Here's, here's the fingerprint of a great leader. They create more leaders. They empower more leaders. We tend to define leadership in a results-based, performance-based lens in our culture. Um, but I would, I would argue that we often look at the wrong criteria and that really the best leaders, the fingerprint is that you just, you see all of these people that have been under their leadership that go on to be remarkable leaders in their own right. And so I want to build a culture where we're building a lot of leaders. And in this particular way, when it comes to generosity, I think defining generosity where it's like every single person in our organization can be a leader in this value. It will look different. If you're a customer support rep, it will look different. It might be sharing your time. It might be the words that you say to employees. It might be, you know, whatever. But it might look different than me on a day-to-day -day basis because we're situated differently. But you can still lead in this. And really for us to have the kind of culture that we want to have, you have to lead in this. We all have to lead in this. And that was a major breakthrough for me, that understanding. And I think that my effectiveness as a leader, when I made that realization, grew a ton because I really, uh, I think I, I transitioned from being somebody that people could be inspired by and could articulate the idea to being somebody who's actually empowering and mobilizing other people to say, I can lead. One of the ways you give generously, I'd say for sure, is you regularly publish your thoughts. Um, the preparation process for me to scroll through your Twitter feed, I, go, I went way back, um, was amazing. I mean, it was like, it was better than a lot of books that I've read in the past few years, honestly. Um, and, and so I think writing like that can have a, a, a lot of benefits. One, you're, you're giving, right? You're being very generous of sharing. Uh, it seems like everything that you've learned along the way. But I want to focus on another part in addition to being generous. I think writing is the ultimate tool for clarity. Absolutely. It is such an amazing teacher. Like, for example, um, I've written a few books and you get a book deal based off of a proposal and a few sample chapters. And then you have to write the full book. Mm -hmm. That process of being like, I had chapter titles, I had an outline, I had ideas, I had a little bit of it written, but actually finishing it, the, one of the reasons I do it certainly is to share and to hopefully help people, but also for myself to lead myself as it is an amazing tool for learning. How has writing helped you learn and get more clear on what you believe? Well, you are absolutely preaching to the choir right now because I, I could not co-sign that thought uh, any more strongly. A, a few thoughts here about writing, and I'll, I'll preface it with this. I am 44. And so generationally, I didn't grow up with a smartphone. And the idea of, you know what, I had a thought, I'm going to put it on the internet is just not part of my hardwiring the way it might be for somebody 10 or 20 years younger than me. I've had to, it's, it's really been an act of discipline, you know, that I'm going to do this because I think it's worthwhile. I think the very first thing is what you said. I believe that there's levels of understanding of an issue. It starts with, I know nothing. I'm just kind of bouncing around. And then over time, I develop a sense of what is more effective. We'll call it intuition. There's almost an intuitive understanding. I couldn't necessarily articulate it. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily being deliberate, but I'm intuitively understanding how to behave in a situation or how to handle something. Then there's this next layer, which is I actually could start to, you know, you and I could have an interaction and... Uh, I behaved in a deliberate way. And afterwards, I could explain to you, here is why I handled that situation the way that I did, that there's intentional thought. And then I think there's another layer beyond that where I can understand situations as they're happening in real time and intentionally pick my course of action. And then I think there's a point beyond that where I, you can teach it. So there's this progression in my mind of how clearly you understand a principle 
And that the ultimate expression of that is when you understand it with the amount of clarity that you could articulate it and communicate it to other people uh, with clarity of thought. And so I, I think you're exactly right. It pushes me to crystallize my thoughts. And one of the things that I think as a leader, the thing that's great about writing is it scales. It's one of the reasons why podcasts are great to me, that there, there's a scalability. You and I are having a one-to-one -one conversation right now, but I know there's other people that will listen to this. And so by putting in the effort to this conversation, I know that many people can benefit. And obviously the internet makes that possible in a way that up until this point had been impossible in human history, that I can put in an hour or two hours clarifying a thought that I've had that I think could be helpful. And then a hundred thousand people might get to read it and might be able to, to get benefit from it. And that it's, it's there forever. It's evergreen, which that's an amazing thing to me. So I, I completely agree with your, your assessment that the reason to write first is that it helps you to have clarity of thought and helps you to develop. It's like getting in the gym for your body. It's a development tool for your mind. Um, I think another thing that's super interesting about writing on the internet is then you don't just go through the process of clarifying the thought and becoming more clear in your own thinking. Then you're allowed to see other people, a bunch of other people, interact with that thought. Mm -hmm. And occasionally then that unlocks even more understanding. And that's happened to me several times where I have an idea. I spend 20 or 30 minutes figuring out how I want to say it. I say it. And then two or three people say things that build on or, or sometimes even challenge that way of thinking. And I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, that does make me rethink it. And so this is, again, another tool for self-development that just really didn't exist quite at the level that that we have today. Um, finally, uh, it's interesting you say that I, I've been asked several times about a book and ultimately what I think if there is a book, a lot of that book will probably just be compiling things that I've written over the years because, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's been for me, it's a great way. It's like journaling almost. It's just a great way to make sure that I'm getting my thoughts out as I'm having them. And by publishing them, you also are increasing your surface area for luck and yeah. serendipity and for relationships to be created. I would not have known of you if you didn't tweet. Um, that's how I became aware of you. I went down the rabbit hole. I read a ton of them. And then I sent you a cold note saying, God, I'd love to talk to you about you know, how you're leading. And I didn't realize you're this founder CEO of Simple Modern. This is insane, right? And I don't think you were even, the, the first one that caught my eye was from something else. I think it was actually about the the, the Mad Men uh, video, uh, which yeah. I'd like to ask you about too when it comes to marketing. But that's the cool thing is, I, I wonder how many relationships have been created because you've had the guts, the willingness, and the desire to be generous by publishing your thoughts online that you've attracted others to you. And then that's created speaking engagements and all different types of relationships have formed because people like, ah, I like the way Mike thinks about, like, thinks about this. I may not agree with everything he's writing, but I like mm -hmm. that he's thoughtful and intentional and putting him out there. And then that generates even more cooler relationships in your life. I have to believe that that's a big part of it too. Sure. Absolutely. And I think that, people that are passionate about similar things tend to want to connect with other people that share yes. those passions. And this is the power of the internet is that in a hundred years ago, it might've been that there are 10 people in my community that have a similar, you know, that are situated similarly and passionate about the same things. In some communities, it might be, there's nobody, right? Uh, that my community has 400 people in it and nobody really sees the world the same way I do. In an internet age, it's like in a world of 8 billion people, there's actually a lot of people that are being intentional, that care about leadership, that want to create things, and that publishing your thoughts online becomes like a magnet for those yep. type of people. And, you know, it's both exhilarating and a little bit overwhelming to realize, oh my gosh, there are so many special people in the world that I would love to be connected with. And so if anything, the only tension that it creates is that you really have to start to think intentionally about time and how many relationships can I maintain. But the amount of enrichment that's come into my life as a result of sharing my thoughts and meeting exceptional people, it's, it's really impossible to put a price on.
I love it. Um, can we can we talk about that? Actually, the 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 mar- the best you said my favorite marketing pitch ever. Okay, this is from Mad Men. John Hams, the actor Don Draper is his character, and and you write. I'll tee it up, then maybe you can expand on on this one. But Kodak in the TV show asked for a branding campaign around a new product. It's a circular device that allows you to flip through pictures, and you said Kodak hopes to highlight the technology and call the product the wheel, but then. They get a masterclass on branding from John Hamm. What, what what happened in that story? So they walk into the boardroom, and John Hamm turns off the lights. the The product is what we've come to know as the the carousel, which it's a it's a slide viewer. You know, you, when you used to take photos, you turn them into little slides, and John Hamm starts just showing slides of his family, and specifically his family when his kids are young. And he talks about how in marketing, one of the most effective techniques is something that's new, that you can kind of create an itch with people, but that there's actually something deeper that you can appeal to with people than new or their desire for new stuff. And that's their their emotion and their nostalgia. And, and he's doing this as he's showing these pictures. It's interesting because in the show, you know, the context of the fact that his marriage isn't going well and that things aren't going well at home. And so what you know is that when his character is seeing these pictures, that in some way he's feeling the the twinge of regret and pain of wanting to go back to the days that are represented in those pictures. And he basically just says, hey guys, this isn't the wheel. It's it's more like a carousel. It's more like a thing that takes you, takes you up and down and back to, to where you've been and, and brings you back to where you started. Uh, but you're different as a result. And and the reason why I love it is that ultimately we, we tend to think of ourselves as such rational, modern beings. But what drives us is what's drived humans for many, many, many millennia. And that is deeply wanting to emotionally connect with others. And the best leaders... Um, the best vision casters are people that are able to tap into that deeper self, not just appeal to our rational mind, not just appeal to our profit motive or our ambition, but we're able to talk to that deeper part of us. And those are the people that inspire us because those are the people that are able to give us a vision of how our life can count in a larger way. And so I love that scene because in a small way, that's what he was doing in that pitch, but that's also as leaders, that's what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do in the lives of other people is talk to that deeper place and to cast vision for, come with me and I'm going to help you move towards a place with deeper meaning and and the future that you want to live in and the person that you want to be. And people are so thirsty for that. People are starving for that. Uh, we, if anything, in our in our culture today, you know, we we have um, a scarcity of that type of leadership. So love that scene, and also, you know, as a parent that has young kids, I've written about this some online. You feel and experience time differently. That my my children now are nine and twelve, and it is really hard when I walk by a book that I read to them every night when they're two years old and that we love together, but has dust on it now and hasn't been opened because it represents a period in time and a part of my life that's been lived and can't be revisited. And I I can either respond to that by being sad or I can respond to that in the most positive way of being grateful that it happened and then making sure that I'm using every day in the most intentional way that I possibly can and that I'm making it count. Because soon enough, you know, it'll be like that book. It'll be part of my history and it'll be lived. And I want to be proud of how I invested that time. And I I guess the final thought that just kind of connects on this, um, the company's been very financially successful. I've gone from basically a missionary that made no money in 20 years to a CEO where I, I own a lot of a company that's very valuable. The number one thing that I've taken away from that experience and having more money than I could spend is how our most valuable resource is clearly time. 
and it's made me value time so much more. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, I, I think, I think that scene captures it perfectly. If you haven't seen it, you should go look it up. Um, but I, I do think it speaks to the larger that as leaders, when we can speak to people's hearts, there's a great, um, Ted talk about this. Simon Sinek talks about um, how the, the golden circle and how we, if we speak to people about why we're doing something instead of what we're doing, that it's so much more powerful actually because of how we work on a physiological level. And I think that that's what that whole scene is getting at. By the way, in addition to like just how good of a guy you are and everything you write online, it makes me want to uh, fill my home full of your product too, and and share others, right? And I and I and I actually spoke to my, spoke to my wife about. I'm like, do we have any simple modern? She's like, I'm drinking out of one right now, <laughs> literally right now. I was like, wow. And I re realized we have a number of them in there. I go, I want I want even more now after doing research, mm -hmm. and and I'm getting ready to talk to the, talk to him. She's like, yeah, I love their stuff. It's my favorite more than uh, Stanley and other ones that are out there now that are getting a lot of love. So anyway, um, you mentioned money. And uh, you've also written about why you don't seem that motivated to sell the company, even though you would get paid tons and tons of money. You said the whole point of having money is that mm -hmm. we can trade it for things that are better than money. Mm -hmm. go, into, go into more about why you're not that motivated to sell the company. Well, so just to expound on that thought, if you think about it, entrepreneurship is really the process of trading things. My intelligence, my time, my, my hard work to try and build something uh, that can make money. So, you know, in some ways, that's what capitalism and entrepreneurship looks like. Sometimes it's in the nonprofit sector and there's a little bit of a different goal. But it turns out that really life is a lot of this. It's a lot of, I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to try and turn it into this other thing. I'm going to try and, you know, rearrange the atoms in the world in a certain way that I think is better. And once you realize that most of what you're doing in life is that you're, you're kind of trading things and moving things around, then... Uh, I think it brings up this question of what are you trying to produce and what are you aiming at? And which goes all the way back to the beginning of what we were talking about. And for me, the interesting thing about money is that the reason why money is inherently appealing to us is the kind of limitless potential of what you could convert it into, that money has um, the ability to be turned into almost anything. A lot of things, right? So can I, I, I can get a new car. I can learn how to swim. I can, you know, like uh, whatever I can, I could throw a party. I could, um, I, I can go into space, right? I can do all these things with money. There's all these things that I can convert that thing into experiences um, and other things. But what is also fascinating to me is that there are some things that you can't actually convert money into, at least not well. Like, I can't really convert money into friendship. Now, can I, if I have a lot of money, can I spend more time with my friends? Does, can that free me up to spend more time with my friends? Sure. Can I make it where my friends and I can go do fun things that we couldn't have done without money? Sure. But can I actually buy friendship? No, you can't. Or at least whatever type of friendship that would be buying is not the type of friendship that you want. Right. And so I become very fascinated with this idea of as flexible as money is, as kind of a trading tool, there is this subset of things that you can't buy with it, at least not well. And that if you look at that subset of things, there's this, this aha moment of that subset of things is actually the subset of things that end up mattering the most to us in life. Hmm. That I can't buy the things that end up giving my life meaning and purpose and joy. Those things can't be purchased. So once you have a lot of resources, you start to realize, hey, there are real limits here. And the limits seem to exist right around the things that I most want to produce in my life. Like, you know, I can't convert having a lot of money into my kids loving me. I just can't do it. You know, I can, I can convert money into my kids tolerating me and coming to Thanksgiving because, you know, they've got an inheritance or whatever. But if that's, if that's how the, the best I can do, that's not really what I'm trying to produce. And so what I've come to term this idea is, is all the things that money can't buy or can't effectively be converted into, I think those are what I'll call priceless assets. And they're priceless because you literally can't buy them with money. And that I think life is primarily about the pursuit of those priceless things. Right now in my life, I feel like I have an abundance 
of priceless things. And so, I, and I already have enough money. So there's, there's this great question of like, well, why would I want more money? Why would I want to convert what I have into more money, especially if, you know, selling the company or changing my life would be really disruptive and could potentially impact all these priceless things, the, com you know, community with the people that I work with and has a sense of purpose and meaning behind the job that I work. I mean, even if you think about it, th this is an idea that most people, uh, it's counterintuitive. One of the reasons why you build a company is to have something to work on. And most people don't get that. Do you have any idea? I mean, like if I was 45 and sitting on a beach, I would feel so bored and I would feel so lost. Like that, man, what am I doing? How am I actually impacting anything? And so one of the one of the rewards is actually that I get to every day, I get to wake up and it's like, oh, I have something meaningful that I get to go and put my time into today and that that actually matters. And so anyway, more or less, I'm in a situation today because I've tried to be exceptionally intentional about creating an environment around priceless things that there is no appeal of more money because the things I want more of, I can't buy and that I already have a lot of them in my life. And so now it's actually like, I'm a lot more concerned with maintaining the kind of healthy place that my life is in. And that's one of the reasons why I'm like, why, why would I sell the company? I, I do think there is one other piece, which is like when you create something special, that the idea of giving to somebody else who might run it in a way that is different or antithetical, and, and you will hear founders say this, that it is it is difficult to to watch somebody take something and a brand or a name that has come to stand for something in the mind of people and then to to make it not that. So there's maybe a little bit of that, but I think it's mostly around this idea of priceless. Mike, I have one more question before we go. I already like to ask for a round two because this is amazing and there's tons of stuff we didn't get to, but one more question, okay? okay. So let's say uh, that I'm the president of your favorite university, okay? And I say, Mike, I'd like you to teach a leadership class and it's going to be called the most important thing. What is the most important thing about leadership? Oh man, that's a great question. I think it would be becoming a person worth, worth following, I think is ultimately what the class would be about. And it would be mostly about leading yourself. That so much of leadership really is, it's about example. And it's about us having people that we look up to and we aspire to be like. And that starts with being the type of person that's worth following. And, and that leadership is not about position. It's not about title. I said this to somebody recently in our organization. He was he he basically was saying, hey, if I had this title, I think people would, you know, uh, would listen to me more or, or I, I would have more influence. And I just had to explain to him, that's not how it really works. It's definitely not how it works here, but it's not really how it works anywhere. Like we listen to people and people have influence in our lives because we respect them. We respect their character. We respect their quality of thought. And that influences us. We've all had bosses that were quote unquote, our leader that we did not look up to or listen to or take direction from any more than we absolutely had to. But we've also probably seen people in our life that didn't have an official title, but man, we longed to be more like them and they inspired us to act different and to be different. And so that's probably what it would be about. And I think, I think it's probably the single biggest misconception about leadership is that leadership is primarily what we do outwardly with and to other people. And really it's primarily about who you are in your person and becoming the type of person that other people want to follow and want to be more like. So good, Mike, founder, CEO of Simple Modern. Uh, I love this conversation and I would love to continue our dialogue, man, as we both progress. This was awesome. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I, I enjoy talking about these things so much and to everyone listening, just to put a, a point on something, a theme that was coming through the conversation, you can you can be this, right? We and we and and I, one of the standards for me, I know I'm going over on time, but I think I think it's a point that's really been impactful to me. It's not about perfection in any of the things we're talking about. And in fact, if it if you do make it about perfection, you're going to quit because perfection is impossible. We're imperfect people. It's about authenticity. It's about this really being what you care about and what your heart's about 
And as long as there's authenticity, people are going to want to follow you. They don't want to follow perfect leaders. They want to follow real leaders and authentic leaders. And so if you're listening to this, no matter how daunting some of these ideas feel, if you are authentically trying to apply them, it will bear real fruit. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me on.